Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, today we're talking about a good news story that helps those who have been given really bad news, and that's young adults who are facing the fight of their life with a cancer diagnosis. A massive fundraiser recently took place at the closing of the Noya conference where Mark Collett, the COO of Crosby World, participated in the Young Adult Cancer Canada Shave for the Brave, and in the process, raised over a quarter of a million dollars. So let's set the stage of why this is such an important cause. Each year in this province, 120 people ranging from teenagers to those under 40 years old are diagnosed with cancer. And we have over 3,000 young adults recovering from the disease or going through ongoing treatment that live in our communities. Cancer hits them in the prime of their life, physically, emotionally, socially, and financially. So joining us today is Dr. Sheila Garland. Dr. Garland is a professor of psychology at Memorial University who's cross-appointed to oncology. She, in collaboration with Young Adult Cancer Canada, a not-for-profit organization, conducted a national survey of well-being of young adults with cancer in our country. They surveyed 622 diagnosed young adults across Canada to explore the various challenges they face as compared to their peers that don't have cancer. We're then going to be joined by Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director and founder of YAC, or Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collette, who, along with all the generous donors, raised that $265,000. Now, granted, he has a little less hair than the last time we talked. They'll share why they did this amazing fundraiser and why Mark shaved his head for such an amazing cause. Let's check it out. Hi, Dr. Garland. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dr. Wall. Hi, nice to meet you. You know, today we're talking about something that is a huge area of your focus. You are a professor of psychology, but you're also cross-appointed to oncology. Tell me about your work. Yeah, so I actually work in an area called psychosocial oncology, which focuses on the emotional, social, spiritual impacts of a cancer diagnosis. So people understand cancer impacts you physically, uh, but they often don't appreciate how much it can also impact all of the other areas of your life. And so that's where my work comes in. That's excellent. You know, we're talking with Jeff from Young Adult Cancer Canada and Mark Collett, who had a huge fundraiser for their organization. And you've also done work with Young Adult Cancer Canada, looking at some pretty important outcomes for young adults that were diagnosed with cancer. Can you tell me about that work? Yeah, so Young Adult Cancer Canada and I started collaborating on, an, on a research project when I came to Memorial University in 2015. And it was largely driven out of everything that wasn't known at the time about the experience of young adults who were diagnosed with cancer. So um, Jeff and, and the YAC team would come to me and ask me questions like, hey, what do you know about how young adults with cancer compare to their non-cancer peers in terms of quality of life and finances? And so they would task me with going to the research literature and trying to answer these questions. And so many times I would come back with no answers, say like, you know, really the, the data is just not there. We just don't know that. So all of these um, gaps in knowledge really um, caused us to say, well, we need to answer these questions. So um, through our work together, we came up with the YAC Prime study. And this was the largest um, at the time um, study of young adults with cancer in Canada. Um, and it's also a now um, one of the leading examples of patient driven research that allows us to be able to use the research, use the information that young adults um, gave us to immediately inform their lives, advocate for improvements in their care, um, change the sorts of opportunities and supports that um, you know, they have uh, in their um, daily lives. So it, it was a fantastic project and we're continuing to work on it right now. That's excellent. And that's the thing. When, when somebody's diagnosed with cancer, undoubtedly their life changes dramatically. But when a young person is diagnosed with cancer, they have a whole other series of challenges. You know, let's start from the beginning and then work our way through these challenges. But, you know, what are some of the initial things people face when it comes to even, you know, finding out they have cancer? 
So probably more so in young adulthood than any other time is the impact of not getting um, a diagnosis um, in a short period of time. So there's this issue of delayed diagnoses when you're thinking about cancer in young adulthood. Um, for example, uh, a 30 year old sitting in their doctor's office complaining of stomach pains. Um, the first thing that the doctor thinks about is not going to be colon cancer. Um, so what can happen is these young people undergo a number of tests or investigations and it's only after ruling everything else out does it come back like, okay, this person has colon cancer. And unfortunately in some of these cases that means that the cancer has grown um, it's, it's gotten more aggressive, which means that young adults often receive more treatments, um, more aggressive treatments. And those things can compli um, complicate overall recovery and make things harder um, to uh, get back to normal after cancer. That's right. Okay. So, so the chance of diagnosis, uh, might, they might be missed easier, but you know, when they do get diagnosed with cancer, depending on the stage of life, you have different things going on. I can imagine people have young families when they're younger, of course, and then they're in the prime of their career. What are some of the challenges that they face, you know, outside of just treatment? So when we talk about young adults, we're actually talking about a huge age span. So right now, young adulthood is defined as anybody from age 15 to 39. So, um, and it's the phase of life that is characterized by the individuation. So people are deciding who they are as people. Um, they're forming relationships outside of their immediate family. They're starting educational careers. They're starting um, occupational careers. They're um, starting families, you know, all of those sorts of things. So that's really how you can define, you know, kind of those under 15 and those over, you know, 40 and older is that there, that's so much transition during that time. So, you know, you might have the impacts that cancer would have on your education. So pulling somebody out of school for a little while while they're undergoing treatment, um, making it more difficult for them to form relationships outside of their immediate family. So dating during cancer and after cancer comes with a whole host of other complications. Um, and if they do have young families, that can hit them financially because it might pull them out of work. Um, and um, they're at a time when, you know, they're very vulnerable, um, vulnerable emotionally, vulnerable financially. Um, people outside of that range may also be vulnerable, but um, they may also have the support that they've already built during that young adulthood that buffers them um, from some of these more um, larger issues. That's right. I mean, I can imagine that, uh, you know, taking five years of your life or whatever during a period of time, if somebody's having a quite a long battle with cancer, it could be a substantial thing about building that network around them. Um, you also study other aspects around things like sleep that, you know, maybe we take for granted, but like, how does it affect day to day life when somebody gets diagnosed with cancer? Well, so we know some really important things coming out of the Yak Brime study. So we actually use this data and the data that we got was from 622 young adults across Canada. Um, and it was geographically proportional. So um, Newfoundland and Labrador was actually overrepresented just because of the connections that Young Adult Cancer Canada has within the province. But, you know, things that... Um, would be maybe not as much of a problem in the young adult, um, young adults without cancer can be a huge problem in those people with cancer. So for example, when we just, you mentioned sleep, something that people just really take for granted when you measure sleep using a validated instrument that has a cutoff of saying like, if your scores are higher than this, you know, that's not good. So what we see in the young adult cancer population is 86% of the 622 respondents that we had in the act crime study um, reported poor sleep according to this metric. That is massive. 86% is a huge proportion. And then if you think about sleep as the foundation, one of the foundational health behaviors that influences your psychological well-being, your physical well-being, your social relationships, your occupational health, um, if you take that out, you can understand why there's cascading impacts everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's right. Let's keep on hitting some of those things that are day to day people might not think of. And you mentioned just briefly, but I want to go back to it. Like a young person, obviously they're having a partner is an important thing during this period of time. You mentioned it can be challenging to date. How so? If you think about all of the um, normal decisions that people might make um, with regards to 
dating um, and being emotionally vulnerable, um, being very sensitive to appearance at that time. Um, cancer can do a lot of things to your physical appearance. You know, it can make you lose weight. It can make you gain weight. It can make you lose hair. It can cause physical changes. If you've had um, tumors removed um, from parts of your body, you, you may, you know, have had a mastectomy. Um, you may have had, you know, as, um, uh, you know, a, a testicle removed or a limb removed even. Uh, so negotiating these, these things when you're trying to, you know, be appealing to a partner can be very complicated. And, you know, the questions of disclosure, when do I tell people that I've had a cancer diagnosis? It can come with questions about fertility. Um, if your cancer treatment has impacted your ability to have children, that might influence, um, you know, it, it, it may be a big deal to the partner um, who you're looking to have a relationship with. So those are all big questions that I think um, young adults would face generally, but are even made more difficult when you have a cancer diagnosis there as well. And sometimes I think partners may just be uncomfortable. Um, they may feel like, oh, I, I'm not sure um, if, if I wanted to take on additional risks with that partner. Right. Right. And that makes sense. Um, the other thing before we move on to like what we can do and how it helps people to be embracing programs like YAC um, is uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and people can be immunocompromised as a result of cancer treatment. Is there any particular challenges that poses for younger people with cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, so I want to set the baseline of um, one of the most important things that we did with the YAC Prime study is... <clears throat> Um, we actually took the same, um, we asked people in the ACT Prime study to complete the same measures as people without cancer had completed as part of national comprehensive um, Canadian surveys. The Canadian Community Health Survey is one, and they asked about levels of distress just generally. So what we did is we took um, young adults with cancer, we matched them to age and sex matched peers on levels of distress to answer the question, how does cancer incrementally impact overall psychological distress? So that would be your levels of anxiety and depression. How are people with cancer comparing to their young adult peers? And what we found is that 47% of young adults with cancer met or exceeded the clinical cutoff for significant distress. And they were reporting distress levels that were significantly higher than their peers. So it's not just like a, you know, oh, well, there's a lot of distress in that young adult age range. It's yeah, there is. But even on top of that, when you add cancer, um, young adults with cancer experience significantly more. There's also something that only young adults with cancer experience, and that is something called fear of cancer recurrence. And so when you're talking about um, times of COVID, yes, everybody might be concerned about their own impact of um, uh, uh, you know, COVID, um, but then you've got the additional complications that come with being immunocompromised. Um, and then even, you know, fears of, you know, what that could do to future health, future recovery. So, you know, fears of cancer recurrence are even higher in the adult age range because they have things still to do. Um, so, you know, if they've got young children, um, you know, they want to be around um, to see their children grow up. Um, if they've got education to finish, if they've got careers to build. Um, so those fears of cancer recurrence are um, also significantly higher in young adults than you find in other age ranges. Right. And that's not surprising that it would be so much more challenging on almost every aspect of life for somebody who's facing cancer, let alone somebody who's who's young and, and supposed to be accomplishing all these things in their life. So we've covered just a few of the factors. There's obviously countless factors that, that impact people. But let's talk about why programs like YAC are valuable. What what impact does having a social support network around you have for these individuals? So that's one of the other things that the Yak Prime study investigated. So we looked at frequency and intensity and also mode of contact with Young Adult Cancer Canada on levels of distress and also something called post-traumatic growth. And so post-traumatic growth is really making meaning out of difficult experiences and using those difficult experiences to maybe make... Um, 
changes, um, different choices in life. Um, and what we found is those people who reported a higher overall connection to the young adult cancer community reported lower levels of psychological distress, lower levels of fears of cancer recurrence, um, higher overall levels of post-traumatic growth. So having that group of young adults that get you, like no other people, no other, no other people do maybe in your own social network, that was really important. It allowed them to not feel isolated, um, not feel alone, have that normalization uh, that needs to occur before you can, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, deal with some of the stuff that's going on in your own life, realizing, okay, you know, I'm not the only one who's had cancer and, and I'm experiencing this. That's yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And that's really what we're going to talk about in the next half of the show is we're going to be talking with Mark and Jeff about, you know, why this is so important and how this breaks down some of those financial barriers for people to be able to access programs like this. Um, I've got a feeling I'll be knocking on your door again for a conversation around sleep. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much. Now, here's an obvious one. I think that it probably has even bigger significance than I can imagine, but that would have to be the financial aspects of having cancer young person. If you're an older person, maybe you have insurance or maybe you have savings, but as a young person, you might not have that. Can you tell me about the financial challenges they face? Yeah. So I think, again, you have to um, consider where the young person might be at, right? If they're just sort of starting out on their own, um, maybe they have to move in with their parents again um, and rely on their parents where they wouldn't have any savings or any health insurance. Um, depending on how old they are, they may not even be covered under their parents' health insurance. So they may be paying out of pocket for um, some of the care that they need to provide. Um, with the Yak Prime study, we actually uh, collected some data on this. And so we know that at least 70% uh, reported six or more months out of work. Um, so, you know, that's huge. They were also, um, the majority of them were spending um, at least uh, $100 out of pocket on cancer related expenses per month. Now, when you're not making much, you know, that is a big part. We also looked at um, those people who are under 35 and compared them to, their um, age and sex uh, matched peers um, without cancer. And we found that they were um, twice um, more likely not to have any assets at all. So that means that other people were building assets where they just didn't have that possibility. And then we look at people who are over 35 um, that had been diagnosed with cancer in young adulthood. And what we see compared to their age and sex match peers is that they were really holding more debt at that time. So they were, you know, one and a half to two and a half more times more likely to have student debts um, that hadn't paid off, hadn't been paid off, um, student line of credits, um, credit card balances, um, payday loans. So um, the debts that they were incurring in the younger age, they, they didn't have the opportunity to pay them off. They were incurring more debts. So um, there's this uh, ratio of them having more debts and having less assets um, than their age and sex match peers. So there wasn't a significant difference on income when we look at this, but there was a significant difference in debts and assets. And those are things that hurt people in the long term. Um, so the young adults who were diagnosed with cancer just never completely caught up to that peer. So it was hurting them, you know, even five years and plus after um, getting their diagnosis. That's wow. not fully appreciated. Yeah, that's a, that's almost in certain aspects that that's an illness that affects you the rest of your life, even if it doesn't. That was Dr. Sheila Garland. When we come back, we'll be talking with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collette, who is the organizer and the recipient of a new haircut in that record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised over $265,000 for young adults with cancer in Canada. Welcome back. We're now going to chat with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of YAC, or Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collett, who is the organizer and recipient of a new haircut in that record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised a whopping $265,000 for Young Adult Cancer Canada. 
It's a pretty incredible story of the community coming together to support a great cause. But I'll let them tell you that for themselves. Let's check it out. Hey, Mark. Hey, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, dude. That's great to see you guys. Uh, it's nice when I've got two of my friends on the show uh, who worlds collide, and they really collided recently because you guys pulled off a heck of a fundraiser. Uh, Mark, tell me about the recent event you guys were both involved with. Yeah, we uh, uh, Jeff and I worked together on a Young Adult Cancer Canada shave uh, that really involved the offshore oil and gas industry. We called it the NL Energy Shave for the Brave. So this all uh, uh, started, uh, I guess, about a year ago uh, when uh, you may recall there was a industry rally in support of the oil industry on Confederation Hill. And uh, Jeff got up and spoke about how important the industry has been to uh, the community and in particular to Young Adult Cancer Canada. And I just, uh, I guess I, I walked away from that feeling pretty inspired uh, how, how he got up there. He showed a lot of courage and, and spoke up for, uh, for the industry and sort of walked away thinking, geez, I, uh, I think we got to find a way to say thank you to him for, uh, for stepping up like that. So Mark, you walked away from this and you felt you need to do something, but what in particular did you actually do? So, so I, I, I walked away thinking there's gotta be a way for the industry to, to stand up and, and, and say thank you to, uh, to Jeff and to Young Adult Cancer Canada. And, and I guess the kernel of the idea uh, was to, to do a shave. And, and Jeff and I have uh, joked for several years now about how he, he, he was, he's hoped that one of, the, one of these days I would go and, uh, and, and pull, the, pull, pull, uh, pull a shave off. And, and um, I guess that day I got inspired and I thought, well, I'll certainly shave my head, but, I, but I, I'd like to find a, a different way going about, uh, about doing this in a way that really can pull a community and, and the industry together. And so what started as a kernel of an, of an idea, I, I, I phoned uh, Charlene Johnson, uh, the CEO at Noya. I've known Charlene quite a few years. I've been on the board there uh, and was just in my last year at that time on the board and thought, well, maybe there's something we can do here together uh, with the industry. And Charlene was all in. She, you know, the first thing that she said to me was, let's do this. Let's tie it to a, a major Noya event when there's a lot of people that come together. And so uh, I love that idea. And then my, my second phone call and, and, and the third and the fourth, I, I started to call the operators, the, the, the upstream operators in the oil, oil sector, companies like ExxonMobil, uh, Husky, uh, which is now uh, operating as Sonovus, Suncor, Equinor, and overwhelming support. Just it was just it just took off. It was a spark that took that that really took a hold. We uh, secured major donations from each of the operators, and in fact, a couple of the explorers like CNOC and BHP uh, showed us a similar uh, desire to be supportive of the community. And then the next step was we started talking to service providers, and before you know it, we we raised quite a quite a haul <laughs> uh, well over a quarter of a million dollars and uh, and that included a lot of individual contributions as well so we were just thrilled it all culminated about a year from the from the time that we we first started talking about this to the the noia conference held just uh, last week here in uh, in st john's and and it was uh, a great success and I, i'm really thrilled to uh, have been had, had the opportunity to be a part of it um, and, and again, so proud of the industry because it, it really did uh, uh, once again show how uh, how much our offshore really cares about community. Well, you know, I know you're not one to brag, but that was a bit of a milestone for an individual fundraiser by through a community, of course. Um, what exactly was that number that you were able to raise? Because it's quite incredible. Uh, I think the number today is two hundred and sixty six thousand four hundred and sixteen dollars. That's absolutely amazing. That's 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 an incredible story. And uh, Mark, that's where we know each other from. We're still in the gas industry. We worked together for a number of years there, and uh, it is a very tight knit industry. Uh, Jeff, you know your organization helps people with uh, young adult cancer. But can you give me some statistics around how that impacts us? You know, maybe people don't realize how prevalent it really is. Yeah. So. Um... You know, our name indicates who we're here to support, right? Young adults with cancer in Canada. Uh, and every year in Canada, there's over 8,000 young adults uh, in the cancer world, uh, increasingly defined as those in their late teens, 20s, and 30s. So in that space of life, there's over 8,000 
Um, and then there's over 200,000 that would be living with or beyond a diagnosis of cancer, often referred to as survivors uh, on the other side or, or currently even living with metastatic cancer and with treatment. Uh, so if you translate that into Newfoundland, you know, that puts you in this space of about 120 or so a year in Newfoundland and Labrador and over 3,000 uh, you know, survivors living with or beyond a diagnosis of cancer. So, uh, you know, really significant numbers, period. But I think if you think about the, you know, the, the stage of life that, that we are in as young adults, cancer survivors, you know, extra important because of the responsibility and the vulnerability and the unique things that we have going on. So uh, it, it's, it's very significant population that way. But, you know, historically in the cancer world, young adults with cancer are referred to as the forgotten generation or generation F lack of progress across the board, research, clinical trials, survival improvements, supportive care, real deficit, no matter where you look. And uh, of course, our role um, is to focus on the quality of life piece, especially for young adults, uh, to help them live with, through, and beyond that cancer experience. And, and we do that in a collection of really important ways. Uh, and we can only do that because we got incredible people like Mark stepping up to get the most powerful haircut of their life. The shape of the brave and, and the other ways that people support us. That's right. And before we get into specifically what your organization does, Mark, why do you think so many people got behind your initiative in particular? Because there's lots of different things people can contribute to, but why do you think this was such a monumental achievement? I, I think, um, well, I mean, I guess there's a few answers to that question. Um, no, number one is there is such a, a community spirit a philanthropic spirit uh, that exists in this industry. Um, but, you know, couple that with Jeff getting up last fall when we were at, collectively at, as, as an industry on our on our back heel. And it was a very difficult time. The road ahead was murky. Um, for those of us working in the industry, as well as the broader economy, because so, so much of the, the economy in Newfoundland and Labrador really does depend on the success of this industry. Um, and with, you know, in the midst of those headwinds, for, for Jeff to get up and do what he did at that, at that rally, I, I think a lot of people saw that and really took note. And so when, when um, we started making phone calls and, and reaching out to see what the level of support for this would be and, and the simple act of saying thank you, um, he, you know, that was something that Jeff did with the industry. He said, thank you for, for what you have done for young adult cancer these 20 plus years. It's very easy to, you know, to, to get people support when you turn around and say, we should, th we should say thank you back. Mm -hmm. That's quite powerful. Gratitude is a powerful thing. And um, that, that alone really did galvanize so many companies and individuals to, to bring this the initiative to the level of success that it, that it did. And, and uh, we, we live in a very giving province and, and the people that work in these companies and these individuals, the, the, when I'm talking about companies of all sizes, multinationals that work here and, and, and the smaller businesses that are here, they're all primarily run or, or at least uh, heavily employed by local people that live here. And the people that come from away, they all become very much part of the community as well. And it's, as I say, it's culturally here, it, 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 we're a, it's, a, it's a province that really does uh, get involved in these kinds of things. And, and I'm not at all surprised by the response that we got because it, we were doing the right thing and that was very easy for everybody to see. Mm, that's right. And I think that we all know somebody who's younger that faces cancer. One of my best friends got diagnosed with glioblastoma. He was on the show for the first episode of the year because he has such an inspirational story because he chose to be positive every day in the face of almost insurmountable odds. But, you know, Jeff, maybe we don't actually know what those people are going through. And that's what a lot of your organization does is help people cope with these challenges. Can you give us some examples of some of the things that you do for people? Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess there's, there's a lot of truth in that, you know, you can't truly know someone else's experience or journey unless you're walking it with them or in their shoes or have been. And, uh, you know, certainly, uh, and we did this actually at the shave event, uh, I asked everybody in the audience to raise their hand if they've had someone they love in their, in their life uh, be touched by cancer, you know, and, and I don't know if, it, if there was a hand left down, like, I, I feel like everyone in the room had raised their hand, which, you know, is a, is a big statement about, you know, how cancer touches our lives. Um, but uh, there's all kinds of layers within that cancer experience that make it unique. Um, 
Uh, it's a huge challenge, no matter when it comes, right? If you're five, 25 or 75, cancer is a big time challenge. Um, but when you're 25 or 35 or late teens, when you're in that young adult space, your life is different. So when you get cancer, it creates different challenges, right? And and you can look at some of the developmental milestones that, that you know, that the three of us have been lucky enough to come through, right? Like you're, you're finishing school, uh, you're starting a career, um, you're starting to push off into that next phase of life. And, and really what you're doing in that space is you're laying the foundation, I would argue, for the rest of your life that you're going to build the rest of your life on. And that's challenging enough uh, on its own. But if you throw cancer amidst that, um, it creates some extra unique and intense experiences for those that are dealing with that, that challenge of cancer as a young adult. So that's that's the like one of the two underpinnings, if you will, of the X mission. The, the, you know, there's two main reasons why we're here. That's one of them, because cancer is different, which means we're not really served by the existing programs that are out there to to support cancer patients. Uh, and then another part of that is, of course, communicating and talking to people about it. And, and another thing that again doesn't surprise probably anybody here, but you know, young adults in particular, uh, research has shown this for a long time now, 15 years. They want to connect with other young adults who've got cancer more than they want support from anyone else. So there's this huge desire to have peers who get it. And that is a phrase that is used in the cancer world a lot. Young adults talking to each other. And it just became this constant state. It was like this mantra everyone was saying at every retreat that we did or conference or anything, just the being with people who get it. Uh, and there's a huge relief and there's a huge power in that. So that's the, a core part of what programs at Yak are all about is this idea of connection. And then, of course, once we get them connected, we keep them connected in community through web based initiatives, other face to face activities. And they're there as long as they want. That's their call. They can decide how much or how little they, they get to access Yak's programs. That's excellent. That's excellent. And you know, one of the ways that you raise money is a really, really fun event. I've, that's where I first met you was at a shave for the brave. Uh, a lot of my buddies have had their heads shaved Ed, tell me about this event and how it goes down. Well, I mean, it is what you think it is. It's the yeah. shave for the brave. Yeah. Uh, and there's two parts brave in this Mike. Uh, yeah. there's, you know, there's brave young adults like Kathy stock who had joined us for the shave, uh, at the Noya conference. Um, and then there's brave people who are getting powerful haircuts like Mark. Uh, so it's, it's got this power mixed into it. Um, the shape of the brave was started, uh, in 2006. Uh, there was a gent, I wish I could remember his name. I apologize to him who in 2005 had his head shaved in support of Yak. I was on the hunt for a new initiative. Uh, to add to our fundraising repertoire. And I saw this guy, it was actually at Holy Heart High School in the auditorium in 2005. If you know who this is, please email me. I keep forgetting his name. Super great guy, really long hair. He decided to get his head shaped and the place went nuts. And I thought, hmm, we can do that. Yeah. That was the idea that started. We started rolling this thing out in 2006 in all kinds of places, schools, malls, hockey ranks, offices. And uh, it's got a couple of really cool parts to it, but, but I think one of the real pure powerful places of it is, is it's, it's not just a walk around the block. It's a big deal. Uh, you, as Mark knows right now, you wear your participation mm. for many weeks after you do it. Uh, shaving your head is not something that just anybody will do. So it has this momentum that is created once you make the commitment. When you say to other people that you're going to shave your head, Mark can speak to this, people react to that. It's, it's this reaction and it creates this momentum and this energy because you've made such a significant commitment. Well, what a couple of things that are fun that happen about that is people talk about it. So it spreads and uh, people give because you're making a big statement yourself about your support for this cause, then people give generously because of that, uh, maybe even more than they do if you're doing other things. So that's a big part of what the shape of the brave is about. Uh, and, and then of course it, it's happened in all kinds of places in all kinds of ways. We're over 16,000 heads in and counting uh, and, and we're not done yet. We got a few tricks up our sleeve on this one yet for sure.
That's excellent. That's excellent. Hey, it's, it's such a fun event. Uh, Mark, I'm so curious to know what your sales pitch was when you called all your friends at oil and gas. What did you say to them? Because they all seem to really get on board. Yeah, I, I think, um, um, yeah, I need to be careful with this because, I, I, <laughs> you know, it, it um, you, when you start with the uh, with the oil and gas producers and uh, you get such a tremendous reaction from them saying, wow, you're right. That was tremendous uh, what Jeff and what Yak did. Yeah. We, we do need to support this. And then it it, it really became uh, an exercise in phone calls to service providers and companies that participate in the industry when they already see that we've got such tremendous support from the producers that it, it almost became, um, well, let's just say there were very few people uh, and companies that, that were unable to participate. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the, the, at the day of the shave, there were two common answers that I got when I reached out to individual companies. Number one was, yes, we're absolutely in, we support it. And the other common answer was, I want to do this. I don't know where I'm going to get the money. Leave it with me and, I'll, and, and we'll make it happen. And inevitably they did. Uh, so that, that was, um, it was quite powerful, I guess, in, in, uh, you know, look, it, it, uh, I keep saying to people doing the right thing is not that hard. And you see that time and time again, in, in this industry, uh, companies want to do the right thing. They want to be part of the community. They want to, want to give back. And, um, you know, cancer is, is, um, it's interesting. The the uh, another discussion point that I would have with because a lot of these companies have structured giving programs and they target specific groups as part of the uh, how, how they how they participate in philanthropy. And um, I, I look at this at this cause and while it is certainly related to cancer, it's got so much to do with young person young people and how it is different for them, for, for young adults. And that's something that really appealed to me when I first got to know Jeff a number of years ago, and he talked about his own diagnosis and how he was just out of university and had his whole life ahead of him and so many different milestones waiting for him. And that uh, um, navigating that as somebody who was going through a cancer journey is materially different that really resonated with me and resonated with the people uh, with the, within the industry that I spoke with. And I think that that, it, it, as, as Jeff mentioned, somewhat of an underserved community and the opportunity to be part of supporting that was, was quite powerful as well. Well, you know, and I think it's also important to note, you know, you have been working in the industry for a long time. You've developed a tremendous amount of relationships and you're the COO of a large service provider offshore. How important is it to leverage a position like that when it comes to doing philanthropic work? Um, if you've got the opportunity to have an audience with people that's got the means to be able to donate. Well, I certainly think it helps to be, to be networked and have relationships. Uh, um, maybe I wouldn't use the word leverage, but just knowing, um, Having a, a, a forgive the antiquated term, a rolodex of, of people that you know who you can reach out to, uh, and and understanding their their uh, uh, company's philanthropic uh, uh, programs and and what kinds of uh, what kinds of causes appeal to them certainly helped. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have been working in this industry now a little over twenty years, so so certainly that. It, it, it didn't hurt. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I, I, uh, I, I go back to how many of these phone calls I had where there was, it was just countless numbers of companies that said, yes, yes, yes. Well, that, that had nothing to do with whether or not I knew them. Mm -hmm. That had everything to do with the, with, with the cause, uh, with Young Adult Cancer Canada. This is, it, 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 it just, it, it is quite a powerful mission that Jeff and his organization started out uh, on over 20 years ago, and it resonates to this day. And that's such a great point. And, you know, uh, we're talking about a massive fundraising event, but Jeff, they don't have to all be this big. Like, what are some examples of different types of events people have done that have made a difference, even if the dollar figure isn't that high? Uh let, yak, uh, I, I believe it, no matter how big or small we are, every dollar will always count. And, and it sure does right now. So no matter what uh, what donor level you are, what shaver level you are, 
uh, we are grateful for everyone who feels uh, a desire to step up and help Yak. Um, and when it comes to the shape for the brave, th this happens in all kinds of ways. Uh, you know, we've got solos, especially in COVID times, more solos than ever, actually doing it at home, mm -hmm. doing it at the salon or the barber shop with their family or their buddies. Um, we've got, you know, small groups of people doing it uh, in the office environment uh, and, and teams as well. Remote shaves happening. There's all kinds of ways to make this happen. Some people um, are very strategic about this. Uh, they lay it out. Mark had this idea brewing and growing for a year. Um, some, it might not surprise you, uh, get it done, registered, and shave within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no wrong way to do this. Um, if someone wants the most powerful haircut of their life, we are here to hook them up with that powerful haircut and ensure that they get uh, get the yellow shape of the brave toque, uh, the symbol of our gratitude to them. Uh, and the only way you get those babies is by cutting 10 inches of hair or, or shaving your head. Uh, they're not for sale. So these are just your, your badge of honor that you've kind of stepped up and participated in this one time awesome event. That's awesome. That's great. And, and we've sort of covered why Mark felt so passionate about doing it, seeing the support that you've given to the industry that he works in and, and provides jobs to so many people here in Newfoundland, Labrador. But uh, maybe people should hear why you are so passionate about young adult cancer. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I was like any 22 year old kid or many 22 year old kids when I was 22. I just finished university. Uh, I moved out on my own. I started my own little business when I was in school. I was pushing my limits anywhere I could find them and just really having uh, the time of my life. And um, just uh, six months out of school, I got diagnosed with acute leukemia. So, you know, my whole world was uh, flipped upside down at that time without question. Uh, shut my business down. Uh, didn't work for 18 months as it happened. Uh, moved out of back out of my apartment back home with my dad. Uh, you know, like my life changed dramatically and, uh, went through a whole bunch of chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant from my dad. And, um, you know, came out on the other side of that with a whole bunch of questions really about, uh, my life and where it was going and what was going to happen. And, and I needed some space and time to figure that out. Um, it was clear to me that I had a unique experience as a young adult dealing with cancer. And it was also clear to me that I wanted to do something with that to help other young adults that were like me. And, uh, and the, those are two main driving forces behind, uh, my path of, of starting yak and, and trying to take that out to young adults across the province and across the country. Um, and, and honestly, there was a huge part of it for me where it was just dealing through doing, I call it, because I really, I really needed time to figure out what had happened to me mm -hmm. uh, and process that experience. Uh, and starting Yak was a big part of that, figuring it out. I didn't know then that I was one of 22 young adults diagnosed with cancer that day when I was 22. But I've learned a lot about the owner cancer experience and the challenges that this population faced. Uh, you know, after like three years in, we had done enough research to realize that you know there's a, there's a lot there's a lot bigger than than I could have ever imagined when I first started out. Um, but we had also done enough research to realize that there was nobody else in Canada doing this work. So, uh, you know, by 2003, we had uh, begun our first strategic planning process and. Uh, and locked into a vision to go and be that resource for these young adults. So there's, you know, uh, 8,000 a year diagnosed, over 200,000 living with and beyond. And, and there is no organization dedicated solely to, to supporting, helping them uh, with their challenges. So uh, that's really the, the, the vision that we have been locked into, you know, since then and continue to be. There are some brothers and sisters of ours now in this space, which we're grateful for. Um, there's momentum in this place, but, uh, I'm not just interested in momentum and I can promise you, I'm not, I'm not really interested in awareness at all, unless it's actually got purpose behind it. And, and so from that perspective, I'd tell you that our biggest amount of work is left to come. We haven't seen meaningful change on the big things that need to happen in my mind, like investments in this population, uh, after treatment, especially on the research side. These are these things that just have not happened yet. So we had a long way to go on that front. And as an organization, for sure, you know, we've had some beautiful milestones. We're proud of those. 5,000 young adults are in our community now that have come through our experience uh, or some access of our programs. But 
there's over 200,000, right, that are out there. So, so we've got a lot of work left to do as an organization, and that's what keeps us going, uh, is knowing that this population really needs the custom support and, uh, and knowing and being able to see the difference that we are able to make in their lives every day. Mm. And I'm just going to, before we jump off of your, our conversation right here, um, I think that the pandemic has to have given very particular and very specific challenges to people facing cancer because it's been, first of all, if you're immunocompromised, then they're at greater risk and a need to isolate during a very traumatic time. How have you guys been able to help people during that period of time? Yeah, there's no question. COVID hit, hit Yak in a very unique and, 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 and interesting, intense way. I mean, we literally, the day before the mall shave in 2020, we shut it down. Mm. It was March 2020. We were ready to have our biggest uh, you know, public event of the year, and we shut it down the day before. Uh, we were about to have our biggest survivor conference two months in May of 2020. Shut that down. So there was a lot of reorganization and, and, and figuring things out early. Um, for us, the, the adjustments in the COVID times and obviously to be lean heavily into the digital spaces, which we were already in because of our network and our, our market, right? These young adults crave and want that. And, and we've been in there for almost the whole, whole of our life. But honestly, guys, the, when, when it first hit, my social feed was full of survivors saying, welcome to my life. Mm. survivors were saying, oh, so now all of a sudden the country is worried about a virus floating around the community that could do massive damage to them or even take their life out. Now, well, that's the reality a lot of young adults live with every single day. Uh, oh, wait a minute. All of a sudden, everybody's got to stay home on lockdown in their house by themselves, isolated. Welcome to my world. That is my life every single day. There was a lot of similarities between what was happening in the community with respect to the response to COVID, especially early, and what life is like for the young adults generally. Uh, th there's a lot of uh, you know, power and unique things that have happened in the last year because of our force to be online. So we've been able to dive into a lot of, I think, really great initiatives that we had had on our list for a while and didn't have the capacity that, to tackle. Um, but they're all web-based, obviously. And, and, and let's face it, for our market, they're, they're glad. They're happy to be there. They're, they're on their phone. They're on their tablet. Yeah. They're dialed into this. They're ready to go. So they were ready to dive into that space with us, and, and they have been for the last 18 months. I know they'll be pumped to get back to a conference face-to-face -face when we're ready and it's safe. But, but nobody, I don't know where that is yet. I, I wouldn't be able to predict when, when that will happen. If you could predict that, you'd be uh, uh, you'd be on every news outlet in the whole world right about now because it is very confusing yeah. times still. But uh, yeah. uh, you know, so you've really established an important need for this, and that it's very specific for uh, how hard it's been for almost any charitable organization right now trying to raise money because the economic circumstances are, are challenging for a lot of people. But Mark, you 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 made an interesting point earlier. You said today we have this much. Can people still donate to your shave? And uh, and and on top of that, maybe you can walk the prospective person through the template that you use to have such a successful campaign? Because maybe there's a formula somebody else can use to raise money like that too. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, absolutely can donate. Um, I am um, I'm resisting the temptation here to say, well, let's drive the record higher. Uh, <laughs> but you can absolutely donate. Uh, the, the website that was set up for this particular shave is live. It's it. I don't know that it'll ever come down. I mean, I, I think if I went on to the Young Adult Cancer website, I can look at previous shaves and there always seems to be an opportunity to donate there. This shave is located at uh, www.nlenergyshaveforthebrave.com. And you can just go through there, right? And 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 place your donation, no, no problem. Um, and and dot no ca, problem. Mark. Sorry, my oh, man. My, my, oh, thank you very much. Hit it again. Hit it again, Mark. Right? Go for it. Yeah, yeah. 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 www. Yeah. All right. Let's start over. Three, two, one. Boom. Yes, we. You can certainly donate uh, to to the, this particular shave. You can donate to any number of shaves through the Young Adult Cancer Canada website. This particular shave is located at www nlenergyshaveforthebrave.ca and we would certainly love to uh, to see that number go even higher it, it's been uh, a, a wonderful experience and and uh, anybody who would like to be a part of it we would love to uh, we would love to see 
That's awesome. And so, so about that template now, just so, cause you were super successful at that. And I know you've got backgrounds in, in organizing large things. You're a COO, you're an operating officer. So what would somebody do if they wanted to have a successful shave rollout? Yeah. I mean, Jeff was saying earlier, it, this was something that sort of came together over the period of well, about a year um, from, from the time that the ideas first sort of took off in my head and then took off more broadly once I started reaching out to the network. But at the same time, people could do a shave in 24 or 48 hours. And I think, frankly, it's the same steps. There, there's something that inspires you. That, that, that's what it started with. I, I walked away that day, September 15th, 2020, inspired to do something and uh, ran through some ideas in my mind and started reaching out to some close connections as to how, this, how we could foster this idea into something that could take on a life of its own. So you started talking to a few people about what, how you think this could, could go and uh, literally sit down and make a list of the people that you want to reach out to and directly target and think about what your message is. It's basically a sales pitch. And, and so that, that's your strategy is, is how, why will this matter to the person that I'm calling? And I really thought that through. And when with each successive call, the frankly, the sales pitch would get modified a little bit to, 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 take, to reflect on well, what really resonated with that, with that particular person that I was speaking with. And it didn't take very many phone calls before you had that final pitch and just run down through your list and let anyone and everyone know that you're doing it. And frankly, when you do that, you're committed anyway, right? Once you say I'm shaving my head, it's out there. <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and you could do that over the course of months, weeks or days. And uh, you follow those, frankly, those, those steps uh, that seem to work for us on, on this one. And, and uh, yeah. So it, it, it worked quite well. Awesome. Awesome. And have support from an organization like uh, Young Adult Cancer Canada and Jeff, who's been there all the time. He's a good coach. He's taken lots of people through it. Uh, before we go, uh, Jeff, uh, is there anything you want to share with folks as uh, sort of a closing message for people? Yeah, um, I would just add uh, to Mark's point, there is, uh, you know, there's power in uh, making the commitment. Uh, it creates momentum. It gets people's attention. Uh, and then uh, and then the the critical step, I think, which Mark did so beautifully, is you just you just give people an opportunity to jump on in and help. And, and that can be in all kinds of ways. Um, but giving them an opportunity to come in and, and be a part of of your initiative, uh, whatever whatever it is the vision that you have created. and uh, and that was incredibly powerful. As you mentioned, over two hundred and sixty six thousand and counting. Uh, set new records for individual shave uh, fundraising and a f an event fundraising. Both of those records is totally smashed um, by Mark and the NL Energy Shave for the Brave. And, and when we're just so grateful uh, to him and to the whole industry and all of those who supported this shave. Uh, we can only do what we do because they have our backs and we're just supremely grateful for that. That's excellent. Well, thank you both for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you, Mark, for donating your hair and taking all the time to raise the funds. I know it's doing a lot of great work for a lot of people that really need it. And Jeff, thanks for doing what you do every single day. Great to be with you both. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate you taking the time and, and your interest in, uh, in the, uh, in the shave. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome guys. That's perfect. I only got, uh, we got less than a minute before my time kicks out in the tough thing. I'm going to reach out to you, Jeff, for a physician, and I'm going to build the case about young cancer to begin with from a doctor then we're going to go into our thing once we build a premise. Can we connect on email? Maybe you have a physician oh, yeah. that you recommend that we talk to. Yeah. We'll set the yeah. stage. I got 33 minutes of our time. I'll be able to chop that down to 30. That becomes the whole second half once the stage is set. We might lose you any second here, guys, but thank you so cool. much. You're the best. Thanks, Send me a message. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Mike. Really Great appreciate it. Weekend. We'll okay. talk soon. Okay, guys. See ya. Take Thanks care. a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you to my guests for joining me today. Also, thank you to Mark and his donors for raising such a significant donation and awareness for Jeff's team at Young Adult Cancer Canada. Now, if you're interested in holding your own shave for the brave, you can contact the team at Young Adult Cancer Canada by visiting their website at www.youngadultcancer.ca. Well, that's our show this week. Thank you for joining me. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of The Wall Show on your VOCM.
We're here with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collette, who was the organizer and recipient of that new haircut in that record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised over $265,000 for Young Adult Cancer Canada. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collett, who is the organizer and recipient of that new haircut that was part of a record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised over $265,000 for Young Adult Cancer Canada. Let's check it out. We're here with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collette, who was the organizer and recipient of that new haircut in that record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised over $265,000 for Young Adult Cancer Canada. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with Jeff Eaton, who's the executive director of Young Adult Cancer Canada, and Mark Collett, who is the organizer and recipient of that new haircut that was part of a record-setting Shave for the Brave that raised over $265,000 for Young Adult Cancer Canada. Let's check it out. 